Hello all and welcome to Stingray Toms, Florida. Today I'm taking a deeper dive into the archive, both literally and figuratively, as I'm going to be exploring Tarpon Springs and its 140-year-old sponge industry. While the small city located north of St. Petersburg continues to be a popular tourism destination, this video won't be the typical story that focuses on the boom time of the Greek sponge diving industry of the 1920s through the 40s. Before I get into the fascinating story, however, I wanted to mention something about the historic images I'm sharing. As usual, they're period photos and postcards from my archive. Since I'm mostly focusing on Tarpon Springs before the year 1900, I don't have access to many images of the time. What I do have are images from other places that are related to the story, but all that will become clear when I get to them. So enjoy! Today, Tarpon Springs is a popular tourist destination. Ask people what they know about the city and they'll invariably mention the sponges and the Greek immigrants who harvest them. It's generally considered that Tarpon Springs has the highest percentage of Greek Americans of any city in the U.S. The Greek Town Historic District that includes the sponge docks on the Anclote River as well as the buildings along the adjoining Dodecanese Boulevard, was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2014. While the Greek Town District isn't the only historic area in the city, it is the focus of its tourism. As important as the 20th century arrival of Greek immigrants was to the story of Tarpon Springs, there was already a hard-working community harvesting sponges in the town. So let's head back to the post-Civil War era. In the 1870s, the first American families had begun moving to the shores of the Anclote River. Of course, these were hardly the first people who would call the area home. Prior to the arrival of the Spanish in the 16th century, the land along the entire Gulf Coast of the peninsula was filled with settlements, many dating back thousands of years. The area was so important that the local indigenous culture which developed some 1,200 years ago was named the Safety Harbor Culture for the significant archaeological site that's located in the city of Safety Harbor, only 14 miles south of Tarpon. The new settlers in the 1870s were black as well as white and would come from many different states including Georgia, Alabama, Virginia, and New York. Of course, there was an economic division between the settlers. Some of the white settlers came to set up citrus and lumber businesses, while others joined black settlers and working in the emerging industries. Others still would set up much-needed businesses that would cater to the two separate Tarpon Springs communities. Surprisingly, there would be another group arriving in the area around the same time. In the mid-19th century, sponge fisheries were developing in the Bahama Islands and in the Florida Keys. Oddly enough, the majority of Bahamians in the 1800s were former U.S. slaves or the children of slaves. A British crown colony, the Bahamas had abolished slavery in 1836, which made it a haven for American escaped slaves. One way the Bahamians could make a living was to harvest sponges in the stunning blue waters surrounding the more than 700 islands in their archipelago. The Florida Keys are nearby, and the Bahamians would also visit that string of islands to fish, hunt sea turtles, and collect sponges. Surprisingly, in the 1880s, Key West was the boom town of Florida. It was the most populous and wealthiest city in the entire state and became the center of Florida's sponge industry, created by Bahamians. So in the 1880s, some of the people who were fishing for sponges in the Keys headed north. Yet again, these were mostly former black Bahamians with their own boats. They and their families found the area quite agreeable and began to harvest sponges using the traditional method. It was likely the spongers from the Keys who discovered Tarpon sponge beds, though it could have also been Keys residents who were in search of sea turtles who found them and shared the news with the spongers. Either way, we know that sponges in the Tarpon Springs area were soon being harvested by immigrants from the Keys. In 
In the Bahamas and the Florida Keys, the waters are shallow enough that sponges were harvested by a process that could be called boat hooking or sponge hooking. Working in clear water and calm winds, the men, often called hookers, worked from small two-person boats. While one man would maneuver the boat with a pair of oars, the other would peer into the water, typically using a water glass, a bucket with a glass bottom, to scan the ocean floor until he spotted a sponge. Then he'd use a long pole up to 30 feet or 9 meters long with a hook at the end to tear the sponge free. The hook was like a small curved pitchfork with two to five tines. Working the hook underneath the sponge, they would sharply yank the hook until most of the sponge ripped free. Depending on how much of the sponge ended up staying attached to the ocean floor, it would be able to continue growing. Modern studies show that hook sponges grow back about one-third of the time, though this only works if the remaining fragment includes the right type of cells. This hooking method is still used in the waters around the Bahamas and the Keys. Initially, when the hookers moved north to Tarpon Springs, they continued to harvest sponges the same way, but in the Gulf, shallow beds aren't as extensive as those in the Keys. Eventually, they began to be over-harvested. There were much larger sponge beds in the water that were too deep for hooking from boats, so men began to free-dive to the bottom. This was accomplished by using weights to pull the diver quickly to the sea floor. The weights would be released when he was ready to head back to the surface. They would use short hooks to harvest the sponges during their dives, placing what they could get in a couple of minutes in a bag. The weights were tied to ropes to be retrieved for the next dive. The spongers would also use knives to cut the sponge free from the sea floor. Harvesting sponges by free diving was harder, more dangerous, and very exhausting, and as as good as the black spongers were, it was some of the hardest work available. By the way, studies have shown that sponge survival rates can be as high as 70% for using a knife to cut them free versus the one-third for those that were hooked. Once harvested, the spongers would store their catch in what were known as crawls. The crawls were fenced in wooden sea pens located near the shore. Crawl is an Afrikaans word from South Africa. It suggested that it's derived from the Portuguese word curl, which is also associated with the Spanish word corral. In South Africa, crawls were an enclosure for cattle located within a village. The term was used in the keys for the storage of both sea turtles and sponges. It isn't clear as to how the term found its way to the keys, but the look and function of the three types of crawls, cattle, turtle, and sponge, are similar. In the Keys, the word has been used for around 200 years, at least for turtles. Upon first seeing them, the naturalist John James Audubon would write in 1832, Each turtler had his crawl, which is a square wooden building or pen formed of logs, which are so far separated as to allow the tide to pass freely through and stand erect in the mud. The turtles are placed in the enclosure, fed, and kept there until sold. Sponge crawls were constructed of small tree branches, as can be seen in the photos. They utilized the tide to allow fresh water passing through the gaps between the sticks. Immediately after harvesting, the sponges would be left on the boats or on the shore to allow the living tissue to die. They would then be placed in the crawls. This would allow the skin of the sponges to partly decompose in order to make it easier to remove. A fully prepared sponge is actually just the skeleton of the animal. While most sponges use silica to create hard skeletons, a few species, obviously the ones that are commercially harvested, build skeletons that are soft. That's what you get when you buy a natural sponge. Hundreds of crawls were dotted throughout the area in the early years as they were throughout the Keys. They were an important part of the process of taking the sponges from harvest to market. After decomposing, the sponges were removed from the crawls and they would be squeezed so that the remaining skin and other tissue was eliminated and only the skeleton remained. Another thing to note is that there appears to have been a difference in the makeup of labor in the Bahamas versus Tarpon Springs. As can be seen in the images from the Bahamian sponge industry, women were employed to trim and sort the sponges. Yet in the few photos I've seen of Tarpon, it was the domain of men both black and white.
In 1887, Tarpon Springs was incorporated with a population of 52. It would become the first incorporated town in the area that would eventually be Pinellas County, which was created out of Hillsborough County in 1912. It's generally considered that two individuals were responsible for reorganizing the sponge industry in the late 1890s and converting it into more of a big business structure. John K. Cheney was from Pennsylvania and first arrived in Florida in 1882 as a land investor. He and some financial supporters formed the Lake Butler Villa Company and bought sizable acreage around the Anclote River area. As the company developed the land, Cheney began to invest in other businesses, including sponge harvesting. In 1891, Cheney formed the Anclote and Rock Island Sponge Company. Yanis M. Concoras, whose Christian name would be anglicized to John, was born in 1878 in the town of Leonidio, Greece, some 128 miles or 206 kilometers south of Athens. He immigrated to New York in 1895 and ended up working for the Lembesis Sponge Company. The firm sent him to Tarpon in 1896 to buy sponges from the locals, most of whom were the black sponge hookers. Kokoris would work with Cheney's sponge packing house as the industry grew. By 1902, three of John Kokoris's brothers had arrived from Greece as well, and they began to realize that there was a greater opportunity to be had if they could harvest the sponge beds that were at a much deeper depth in the Gulf. Utilizing Cheney's wealth along with money from other investors, the Kokoris brothers began importing skilled sponge divers from Greece who had recently adopted the new pressurized diving suit technology using air pump from the surface. After converting a locally purchased boat into a diving boat, they rechristened it the Elpis, the Greek word for hope. By 1905, Greek divers were coming into Tarpon Springs in large numbers, and Cheney and the Kokoris brothers were rapidly building new diving boats. It's estimated that 1,500 Greek men and their families had arrived in Tarpon by the end of 1905. Within a few years, thousands of Greek spongers were permanent residents of Florida's newest boomtown and were operating hundreds of boats. The Greek boats would include ones for diving the deep sponge beds as well as ones for hooking on the shallow beds. All this was made possible by large investments of money and it changed Tarpon Springs and the sponge industry forever. Throughout the first two decades of the 20th century, the Greek sponge fleet would emerge and expand, which forced the black spongers to deal with the new competition in various ways. Some simply found work in other industries such as lumber and agriculture. Others would sign on to Greek-owned boats as deckhands and use their skills to work with the evolving sponge industry. Still others would continue to process the sponges on the dock and in the warehouses. By the 1920s, the traditional crawls were no longer in use. Not surprisingly, because of the sheer number of Greek immigrants, the vast majority saw little need to learn English. Tradition was that the communication barrier was eliminated when the Greek language was learned by black spongers who went to work on the boats and in the warehouses. This helped all the separate communities work together in the booming industry. The 1920s and 30s are considered the golden era of the sponge industry, where some 50% of all sponges in use in America's homes came from Tarpon Springs. Later, the industry would be hurt by sponge die-offs, the invention of the artificial sponge, and overfishing. Today, Tarpon is still a center for sponge fishing and continues to be a popular destination for tourists who enjoy walking along the docks, visiting the shops on Dodecanese Boulevard, eating the authentic Greek food, and taking boat tours along the Anclote River and out to the Gulf of Mexico. I hope this has been an interesting story. Tarpon Springs is one of my favorite small cities in the state, and it's a popular tourist destination. I plan to do more videos on Tarpon, and not surprisingly, some of these will focus on the Greek community and its contributions to the area and to Florida tourism. On a sad note, I wanted to mention that while I was visiting Tarpon Springs last week, I noticed my favorite family-owned Greek restaurant was closed as they were mourning the death of their patriarch. Andreas Dimitrios Salavaris passed away at the age of 80 on May 18, 2021. He was born on Kimelos, a Greek island about 150 miles south of Athens.
He came to Tarpon Springs in 1984 from Cleveland, Ohio. He was the owner and operator of Mykonos Restaurant on Dodecanese Boulevard, directly across from the Sponge Docks. Giving reviews of restaurants isn't a subject that I plan to cover on Sing Ray Tom's Florida, but Mykonos is a restaurant I've returned to many times over the past 30 years, so I guess that means something. My condolences to the Salivares family and the staff of Mykonos. So that's another video from Stingray Toms, Florida. Please give it a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. Stingray Toms, Florida. Traveling through time around the Sunshine State.